All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody to MVP Office Hours number 97. Only three away from our 100th uh, meeting, which is uh, pretty exciting. Um, as I said before, my name is Jared Kingston. I'm a solution architect with Aperio um, and help lead the MVP Office Hours along with uh, uh, my friend Dale Ziegler. Say hi, Dale. Howdy, howdy, everybody. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, our absent uh, person, Jackie Trevieso, uh, who helps keep us uh, very organized within the office hours. So um, let's, uh, let's get going here. Dreamforce, just around the corner, just, just to put that bug out there. Um, and if you haven't followed us on Twitter, definitely check us out um, at, at MVP Office Hours. We post everything out there. Um, all right, well, just a real quick recap. Some of you who have been on before know this, but uh, for any newbies out there, um, MVP Office Hours is basically an open discussion. Um, we do this the first and third Friday of each month, um, and we really hold, uh, hold a value that no question is too big or too small, so don't feel like you're asking a dumb question or uh, this should be easy question. Uh, we're here to help, so don't, don't – uh, uh, don't feel bad about asking questions. Um, we uh, record all of these and we'll post them out to Twitter as well as in uh, the group on the community uh, for for uh, free to you know, go back and reference. Um, and because it is open, we just ask you mute your lines uh, if you're not speaking. That way we can hear the questions and the answers very clearly. Um, and, uh, and, it, and to ask questions, you can either raise your hand in the web portion, portion of the meeting um, or if we have a dead spot and we're asking for questions, feel free to just speak up. Um, that's no problem at all. Um, and then all we ask is, like, if you're responding to a question, just to announce yourself so we, we know it's just not some voice. Um, uh, we know who it is, right? Uh, so those are just some of the ground rules. Uh, but today we have a very special guest joining us to provide his uh, wealth of knowledge uh, for this call um, our uh, friend Jason Atwood, fellow MVP. Um, Jason has got a lot of experience, uh, 15 years, uh, and uh, leads uh, a nice little podcast. I think little, but it's a nice podcast, uh, Cloud Focus Weekly. Um, and uh, he's gonna, he knows all things Salesforce really. Um, but one of the things uh, is you know, specifically is around security. So. Uh, but uh, any questions you have for him, I think he's ready to go. Is that my cue to talk? <laughs> That's your cue that we're going to start taking questions. All right, great. Uh, yeah, so let's get going. Who wants to uh, kick us off with the uh, first question here for, for Jason? Very quiet. I was going to say, my first question before anybody asks the question is, how do you measure the size of a podcast? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> is it big? Is it small? I don't know. Is it the file size? <laughs> is it 248 episodes? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably a, a phrase that uh, probably shouldn't use to reference a podcast. <laughs> actually podcasting uh, after this, so there will be another one up by the end of the day. And uh, we just celebrated last, in July, we just celebrated our sixth year of podcasting. Wow, nice. I, I know, crazy. You, really, uh, you guys were one of the first ones out there, really kind of laid the, laid the groundwork, I'd say. We, uh, it, yes, and we are trying very desperately to keep up to the this is the title of the podcast being Cloud Focus Weekly, although it's getting harder and harder to come out with weekly episodes, but uh, we're either going to rename it Cloud Focus Periodically or uh, <laughs> Cloud Focus Whenever We Get a Chance to Produce Something That's Completely Free, whatever, something like that. Yeah, I like it. All right, well, we got a, a hand raised. Julia, you have a question. Go for it. I'm going to be brave and go first. I am Julia, yeah. and I join my work for a company called iTerrace. Um, so I'm in my second year of being an admin. I came in with an org that was already set up, and unfortunately um, I do have other responsibilities outside of being the Salesforce admin. 
So somebody who's still learning and quite a bit new, um, what, what should my security concerns be? What, what should I be looking at? Or are there resources out there that you can possibly point me to? For, for learning about sort of what, what you should be concerned about, which is inheriting an org? I have yeah. Salesforce or more in the security aspect of things? More in the security aspect. Okay. Well, I'm sure everybody's just at the edge of their seat trying to say, trailhead, trailhead, trailhead. But obviously that would be the first place if you need to learn about security and Salesforce security and, you know, what it means and what you should be kind of, I guess the big picture, I would definitely start at, at trailhead. Um, there mm -hmm. are um, paths for learning about security, and you, you just want to get the overall, right, the overall basics of it. Mm -hmm. um, I would start there. Then once you kind of understand, you know, how things can be entered, where people can come from, what they should be able to see, um, then I, I would do an org review. So, I mean, I would personally go in and I'd start looking at things within the org. So I'd be looking at, you know, what, how many profiles do they have? How many custom profiles? What's in those custom profiles? Um, what are the, uh, you know, what are there any restrictions on IP restrictions or login hours or, you know, how do they have it set up? And then I'd be looking for problems, right? Hey, they have, they don't have two-factor turned on. They don't have, they have everybody set with no password policies. They have uh, no IP restrictions. They have uh, 15 different custom profiles all cloned from a system profile. Right? These are things I would go, ooh, those are flags. Like, they're, they're problems, right? They're leaving a lot open. Uh, maybe the data model is completely open. Sharing is open for everybody, but yet the business doesn't want it to be so. Um, then I would probably go and take a look at uh, sort of logins, and I'd look at all the active users, why they're logging in, what they're doing. Um, and kind of, I'd find probably the top 5% of the active users and I'd start to see what, what their particular profiles do have. You know, do they have dangerous things, again, like view all, manage all, right, anything all <laughs> on their profile or in an associated permission set? I'd want to see why. You know, oh, they have view all data. That's bad, right? I'd, I'd want to, I'd ask, then I'd go back to the whoever set it up or the business person and say, did you mean to give everybody that? Um, those are things that I generally see when we look at look inside of a, a taken over org. Is that is that helpful, or do you want more like go here on the web and learn, and go here on the web and learn? No, I think that's all very helpful to get me started with. So you know, I'll take a look at Trailhead first, and I'm I'm sure I can probably find additional info just poking and yeah. searching around. And I'm actually I haven't used this tool, which is kind of bad, but I think as of a few releases ago, there is a new um, there's an audit tool inside of Salesforce um, that does a, and I'm trying to think where, where it is, uh, that you can run that's like, hey, it'll, 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 it'll audit itself. Uh, it used to be an app, it used to be a third-party app that you would install um, that would sort of look at your, at your, um, your security, uh, but I'm pretty sure, maybe I'm just dreaming this, Sometimes as I'm reading so many things that are coming out, I don't know what's actually in the app anymore. But there, there is a, um, I'm pretty sure there's something that goes through and looks through your org and sees if there's, you know, any concerns. So it's like a, you can run it as like a wizard. Oh, health check. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so under security right. controls, uh, there's a health check. This is rather new. I think it's like within a release or two. Um, so that, that's a nice way to start. Again, I'm more maybe old school. <laughs> I, would, I would go in and start looking at profiles and on field level security myself. But this way, at least you can go in. So you go to set up security controls, health check, um, and then this will, it, this does a high level and it says, hey, here's some high risk security settings, here's some medium risk, and here's some, you know, meet secu standard security settings. Again, it's based on best practices and whatever whoever built this, you know, Salesforce came up with. And so sometimes that's okay, but sometimes you have to be thinking about, well, am I in an industry that needs higher end security? So in, you know, like financial services or, or medical industries, um, you know, they want to be at the very, very high end. And so you, you can't just take the standard stuff. But at least that's a good place to start and you get a nice little score and you get a little progress bar here. So that might be a place to just start quickly to see what's in there. Okay, and then you mentioned looking at profiles and, and like if there's a lot that have been cloned from a system profile. Is, is there an issue with cloning profiles from a system profile? 
Um, <laughs> now we're getting to opinion, but yes. Uh, so <laughs> the, 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 the system administrator profile, the one that comes, you know, out of the box, has basically access to everything. So, you know, in, in security, you kind of want to grant things, not take things away. So it's almost best to start with a low-end profile and then give things to it than it is to take, hey, this profile has every access to everything, and then I'm just going to pull out stuff. Because the chances of you pulling out the, of you not pulling out some feature that you don't know about, I, mean, I don't know if you guys, if you looked at a profile, the profiles are, are huge. They've got uh -huh. hundreds and hundreds of stuff, and then and in each link could be another hundred things. So it's very, very, um, uh, you know, very, very complex. And of course, the system admin profile has everything. So what we find is people will, by mistake, they'll take a system admin profile because that's what they have. They're the admin. Then they'll clone that, and then they'll give it to a user. They'll say, oh, okay, this is my new standard user profile or my, you know, blog company profile. Really just not a good back, best practice. Um, you should usually start with, you know, start with one of the lower end ones, the standard one. Um, you know, that's where I would start. I start with the, let's see, standard X, standard user profile. And that's where I start. And then I pull out stuff that I know is bad, right? So maybe exporting reports is a bad thing, right? Because you don't want people to pull your data out and go somewhere else with it. So there's just certain things you have to know by your client or by your, your company, what what they're concerned about. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Great way to kick off the call. Good stuff. Yeah, that health check feature, I've, I've seen a lot about it, but I haven't, admittedly so, I have not uh, looked at it too much. And I just looked at my developer org, and like the first six lines are like high risk. So. <laughs> yeah. I just, I was doing the same thing. I'm in my developer org and I just looked and I have three high risk and eight medium risk. This used to be, I mean, for us old school Salesforce people, there used to be an app that you installed from the App Exchange that did this. And I think they just eventually, um, you know, you'd get in, then you'd run it, and it would run a bunch of, you know, Apex or Batch or whatever, and it would come back with some report that you could then follow. Um, it, you know, recently Salesforce has been much better about building these things inside of Salesforce so you can run them and you know run them over and over again. You don't have to know about them. So cool. Next up. Yeah. Who's next? I see some new faces. I see some names that I know on there. And it doesn't have to be about security. I mean that's that's the topic I picked just because whatever, but you know, I'll I will talk about anything that I barely know forever. Podcasting, even. What's your best? What's your favorite podcast? Oh, oh James, James got James got a question. Okay, great. I'll go. go for it, James. Um, so we have uh, we're trying to go to the SAML based um, SSO. And what we're using for that, we call it our employee number. So I was wondering if I can use Process Builder to drive an update on the user object so that whoever's doing the entry of the person, if we can just automatically populate the employee ID from the federation ID. I know there's special rules around the user object, but I'm not sure. I haven't been able to get it to work. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, obviously, for the, everybody, you know, process builder, so the, the next generation of workflows, um, and, you know, can do a lot more than workflows and approval process could do, uh, but does have some limitations. And I'm actually just looking because I don't remember off the top of my head. I do see user as, a, um, as an object that you, can, that you can run a process off of, mm -hmm. so that would be it. Could start now. How far did you get? So I see it as an object, so it means I can do something on it. How far did you get, or what is, what issue did you run into? Well, I got as far as um, determining whether or not the federation ID has changed as my criteria. Yeah. And then when I went to set the value, like employee ID did not show up. So then I tried doing a custom field, another just rep number, which is a standard text field and to try and reference 
the Federation identifier field, I put user within brackets dot Federation identifier, but I'm not getting the results I wanted. Hmm. I do see both Federation user ID and employee ID as fields that you can that you can trigger off of, meaning from the from the process bill and the criteria. Um, but was it was it under the immediate action that you're trying to do something? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, so I selected update the record under the yep. immediate action. Uh, let me bring it back up. Hey, so this is Dale. Have you tried running a flow that looks up the user from the process folder? I have not done that. Yeah. The good the, the fun is you get to you get to drop out of the uh, process builder UI that's semi friendly and go to the flow UI which is not very friendly at all. But flow does allow you to have much more it allows much to do things that are more complex, as well as one of the things you can do is pass um, uh, IDs between things. So you can say, oh, this this data was created, grab the ID, and then use it as part of the flow, which is something you really can't do with Process Builder. So it's possible that, that you might be able to access to it in a flow. Right. And I mean, really, the flow would just be a record lookup passing in that user ID um, and a record update. And then you're out. <laughs> and you're out. <laughs> well, you hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Record update. I'm just I'm doing it while we talk about it. See if I can grab get to the user. I'm sure you can. All right, what else? That was a good one. Oh yeah, tons of user fields. Yeah, I can see them. It's just yeah, maybe my syntax is wrong. Who else? All right, Satcrit. I know that name. Go ahead, Sat. Sat, you have your hand raised. I think you may be on mute. Let's go to Stuart. You have a question. Hi. Hey. Go for it. Yeah, so um, I, I listen to a little podcast that uh, I hear Jason and Matt Wood on every now and then. And I know that in that, uh, in that podcast there's a, a lot of talk about um, GTD. Oh, man. And, uh, and I just wondered if you uh, can describe ways that you personally use it in your Salesforce work, and then as a solo admin, um, how can I, you know, I know a little bit about the, the um, philosophy around getting things done, but just in my Salesforce solo admin work, what, what sort of high recommendations would you have about how I could implement that? Sure. Um, so I actually used GTD. For those who don't know, we're talking about a productivity methodology, which, again, if you listen to the little podcast, we cover a little bit. I will throw in a, um, I'll throw in a little plug for the nonprofit summit, which is out there on the interwebs right now. Uh, it's a free summit with videos like speakers uh, run by Missy Longshore. You Google it, you'll find it, or find it on my Twitter handle. Um, but on Saturday, I don't know why I'm on Saturday. I hope that's a good thing. I don't think that's good from a scheduling point of view. But on Saturday, my session on GTD is going to be. So if you're, you want an hour long of me actually in video, so I know in the podcast we've never done video, so it's the first time you're going to get to see me on video. Um, Whoa. But yeah, I know, really. So <laughs> anyway, that, that's a plug for, for that summit. It's, the, it's called the uh, Nonprofit CRM Summit. Uh, it's free to watch and play now. I think later it's not. But anyway, I do a whole hour on GTD. So we'll just put that aside as a, as a plug. Um, I did use GTD when I was just a sole admin. Um, you know, I, I think for me it's, it's I, I would, to bring it back to Salesforce world, you know, in Salesforce you've got probably lots of just moving parts, 
right? There's lots of things you're doing as a solo admin. Let's call them projects. And, and then TTD would call them projects as well, right? Someone wants a new set of functionality. Someone wants to build out some new security. Someone wants to install some apps. Someone wants to do some stuff. And so as an, ad, so as an admin, you're constantly being, you know, uh, slammed with different types of requests. Um, and you know, part of managing that workload is having a place to store, right, to capture all the requests that you get. Right? Sally catches you in the hallway and says, "Hey, you know, could you build me a report for blah 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 blah?" And you know, to learn how to capture that quickly into your system, you know, the GTD ism. Um, or you know, your boss sits you down and says, "Here's some five things we need to do," and so you capture those and put them into your system, and then you're kind of capturing the points of what to do next. So then as you go through and you have all of your sort of GTD-esque projects, you know, you can then through a daily or weekly point go through and say, okay, well, what are the next actions on those? So I think what, what I still use it for and what I find a lot of people, you know, a great a piece that really helps them is that they not only capture what they need to do next, right? I need to build this report. I need to build this process. I need to go look up uh, security training or whatever. But a really powerful point is to capture the thing that someone else owes you. So a lot of times, you know, you send something over the wall, hey, Sally, well, you got to get me that, you know, you got to get me the write-up that you were going to do. Or, you know, someone else says they're going to send you requirements or someone else, like those, like, waiting for, as we call in GTD, they're great to capture because then you capture the, G you capture the waiting for from somebody else and then you follow up with them, right? So if you don't get it back in a week, you're like, hey, so you said you were going to send that over. And then, you know, you look great because you're on, so on top of it. So it's, it's, you know, the work is the work and capturing what you need to do is important. But I find that a super ninja trick is that you're capturing other people's commitments to you so then you can be on top of your game. So you then are, you know, they're like, oh, wow, man, nothing ever gets by that person because they're, you know, they're, they always follow up with me. Um, so I think that's that's a nice hint and certainly something in the in the Salesforce. I'll bring it back to Salesforce in the Salesforce world with lots of moving parts. You know, having a place to keep all of that and then going through it once a week and saying, hey, look, oh, you know, Paul hasn't gotten back to me about that thing. Let me follow back up with Paul. Um, that's very helpful. Did that help a little bit? Is it good? Want more? <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Awesome stuff. I love how I got into GTD in about 28 minutes. Awesome. All right. Who, uh, who wants to go next? Zach, go ahead. If you're talking, I think you may be muted. If you're talking, we can't hear you. I will fill the time with some of my favorite security tools if you guys don't talk or ask me questions. <laughs> Here's the, here's a question in, that Sat was wanting to ask. How does how does a lightning does the lightning experience have any impact on flow? Does the lightning experience have any impact on flow? Oof, this is where you have to you have to like admit the admission, which is that while I know about lightning experience and while I certainly play with it now and again, I have we are not 100% adopters yet, so what it does and doesn't do in the back end. I mean, in, in theory, flow is happening on things in the back end, right? It's, it's things that happen, like records are updated, it's doing things. And Lightning experience is much more about the front end. So without knowing a lot about that, I'm just going to say, I don't think it really matters. You're doing something in Salesforce. You're clicking it. You're saving a record. It's on that save of the record back in Salesforce world that um, a flow is going to trigger, and that flow is then going to do something. It's going to update a record, create a new record, do whatever. So I don't really think there's a big connection between the two. I think in the UI sense, um, you know, there's definitely a movement to making things, building things in, more into Lightning. 
workflow itself, the user, the user interface, is certainly not Lightning right now. Um, and I've heard the grapevines that you know, Flow and Process Builder are probably going to make a merge at some point, and Process Builder is much more of a Lightning app. So I think that's really that's my thoughts. Yeah, that's good. I haven't I haven't had a chance to play with that. I'm a big I, I'm a big Flow guy, but I haven't had a chance to really look at what it looks and feels like when you launch it from Lightning. Right. Right, like an interview flow where you have screens and text and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna just guess and say it doesn't do too well. <laughs> well, and and so along the lines of flow, not necessarily lightning. I'm wondering. Um, I thought I heard somewhere that Salesforce is stepping away from Flash as well. Or, or did I miss? Did I miss hear that along I, the way? I mean, I don't know where I heard that, but I definitely heard that that's a thing. That's a real thing. And and that's what Flow is built on, correct? At least the uh, the the developers interface is the designer, flash. yeah. Yep. So. so if nothing else then the designer itself. But I, I I mean again, history wise we know that Flow is something they built they bought, right? They bought an app. It used to be a desktop based app, um, that you had to run on like a Windows desktop to build them. It was very odd. And so they eventually moved it into Flash. It just the feeling is this is going to move right because there's there's things that Process Builder and Flow overlap on. Flow is completely more uh, you know more powerful in a lot of ways, but it's not as user friendly as, as Process Builder for all of Process Builder's faults. Uh, so I think the direction is Process Builder is is the future. Flow features are going to move into Process Builder, and Process Builder and Flow are going to become one, merge at the hips. And since Process Builder is Lightning, um, I think that's that feels like what's going to happen, and Flash will get thrown away when when that happens. Safe harbor, safe harbor, safe harbor. Yeah, right. and I was just reading. I was just reading the Winter 16 release notes, and it does say that you know Process Builder and Workflow, as well as Visual Force, or sorry, Visual Workflow and Approvals, they're also supported. Well, Process Builder and Workflow are fully supported, whereas Visual Workflow and Approvals have. Uh, are supported with some limitations, and the only limitations on flow are paused flow interviews. Um, you can only resume those within Salesforce One or Classic, um, and then the the way you uh, distribute that flow um, is dependent upon you know Lightning experience features. So. Um, and I know, Sat, you had another question related to that. If you, uh, if you have, uh, if you want to move those customer forms in Flow and want to make them mobile, um, is there any impact? I would, I would just go ahead and answer that and say I don't think there would be any impact if you're just putting them on Salesforce One. Um, Flow should auto size, I believe, to the device. Uh, I haven't fully tested that, but um, that would be my thought. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that. Uh. All right. All right. We still we still got just under thirty minutes left. To uh, who else has a question, or else Jason's going to start. Uh, Listing off my favorite apps. Oh yeah, my favorite security apps. I have two that I'm playing with right now. So, let's go ahead and hear them. All right. Well, first one, I'm gonna do one self, one one we built, one we didn't. So I'll start off with Perm Comparator. So that's I will send that. Should I just send it into the chat link? I you guys. Yeah. Know it. Yeah, just drop it. yeah. There you go. Um, so a, uh, a Heroku-based app, which is awesome, um, that allows you to compare, because a lot of times you're trying to figure out why someone can do something or can't do something or what some permission set has in it versus another. Salesforce permission sets are awesome, obviously, but uh, one of the things, they don't have very good uh, analytics to them, to find out what's in them, what's not in them, so it's kind of tough. So this app is Heroku, it's free. Um, I use it all the time, 
and it allows you to uh, you know, single sign-on in, which is great, OAuth in, and then you can uh, compare things. So you can compare users to each other, say, hey, I want to compare, in the example I'm doing, I'm comparing myself to another person called Bob Boberson, and then I can go through these different layers and say, you know, here's what, here's what we share in common, here's what our common things are, here's what our permissions that are not common, differing or not. So you can do it at a user level, which is awesome. You can also do it at a permission set level. Probably more importantly for most people is do it at a profile level. So I can take two profiles. Um, I'm throwing one called account reviewer, and I'm throwing another one called uh, I don't know, marketing user here, and I'm throwing them up against each other. And then I can see what they have in differences, what's different about the two, what's you know, unique about them, what they have in common, you can compare up to four things at a time. So it's, it, it is a perm comparator, <laughs> um, very good, free, uh, it's got to be in every system admin's pocket. I can't imagine anybody living without it. Ready for questions or should I keep going? I think you should keep going and I will say that's awesome. I, I did not know about that tool. So. Oh my goodness. Oh geez, that's the best. I Second best, second best tool on the planet. <laughs> First best tool, uh, I'm going to pull it up here. Uh, and, uh, sorry, I, have, I actually have it installed in the app in the org. I'm going to throw it into uh, the Ready Talk here. Um, First favorite app, and this is self promoting, um, is called the Permissioner. Um, so the Permissioner is an app. Uh, created many years ago, so 2012, wow, it's an old tool now, uh, that allows you to uh, mass assign and mass revoke permission sets. So, you know, permission sets are sort of, let's say, the, the way forward out of the hell of having hundreds of custom profiles. It allows you to take individual things that are within profiles and allow them to break them into sets of permissions, which then can be assigned multiples, which is great. So you can layer on permissions on a user. You can add multiple permission sets. Obviously, users can only have one profile, which is the problem with profiles. So, but the issue is to assign a ton of permissions. So let's say you have four or five permission sets, and you want to assign them to 10, 20, 30 different people. Um, that's not an easy task. You kind of have to go one by one user. It's actually a feature in Salesforce that they had to build, but it's still not as good as the free, the permissioner. The permission allows you to mass assign. You can go in, you pick uh, the permission sets you want, um, and then you can pick all the users, and you click, 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 and hit assign. It then assigns you know, many, many permission sets to many users and sends you a nice email along the way. Uh, free as you can be, um, and a good tool for, for security-wise. How's that one? Everybody's heard of that one, though, right? Definitely heard of that one. That is great. Classic, great tool. All right, no more questions. We're going to get one more. I'll spend the rest of the time just plugging apps. Awesome. Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> All right, well, we're on. Since I only had two in, my, in the hopper, um, I'm now going to go to a standby here. Uh, and I'm going to plug yet another one of our apps. But it's still an admin app, so whatever. And it's free, so actually it's not even... Um, so another, and this is a little bit of a, I'll spin it to security. So one of the issues of having users is if it users, you have a profile, and you can take a, you know, when you create a new user, great, you can create a new user. Um, uh, but if you want to create another user from um, that, like, is like somebody else. So let's say Bob is a new employee, and your boss says, hey, I want to make Bob just, you know, it has a whole bunch of stuff. It has uh, permission sets assigned. It has a lot of data on them. They have, uh, you know, a groups or queue assignments. Lots of things are assigned to the user, sort of related things. And as you get more complex, you get more and more of those things assigned. So creating a new user in, in Salesforce, we click the new user button. Not only are you filling out the fields, that's, you know, if I just have to fill out the fields, but there's all that stuff you have to go. So, you know, in the past, you would sit there with, you know, two windows opened, and you'd be looking at, one window of, you know, the old user you need to, to sort of make it like, and then the new user, you have to replicate it. 
No longer. There must be a better way. There is a better way. Uh, so you use, you use clone this user, uh, CTU, another free app uh, by, uh, by the company I work for. Um, that is a, that allows you to take a user and clone it to another user. So it will then pull in all of the uh, related details. Not everything, because there are some limitations in the API and what you can do. Um, but it, can, it pulls in a lot, a lot of things that uh, are commonly assigned and, um, you know, like, like the call center they're in, their manager, the profile, the role, um, permission sets, permission set assignments, public groups, queue membership, right? Lots of stuff, whether they were a knowledge user or not. So tons and tons of features, uh, things that they clone, and then it just will build that new user for you. Best of all, it works on a desktop, great. It's just a button you throw, um, you throw in on the profile, the user uh, record. But it also has a nice mobile version. So our, our use case was, when we, were, when we were talking about building it, was the, you're a system admin, you're out to lunch, because you know, you're having a nice boozy brunt lunch. Well, I shouldn't be doing that. Okay, you're out to lunch, and, but you get a call from, or an email from your boss or somebody saying, hey, we have a new employee, I need to set them up immediately and they need to look just like this other user. And so you go in and you can fill out, I think it's four fields. Uh, let's see, it's not a lot of fields. It is, uh, let me go to the next one here. All right, so yeah, you go in, you pick a user, so you pick the user you're cloning from, right? And then you fill out, you fill out five fields, although two of them fill out for you. First name, last name, email, and then you know, username fills out for you, and then um, the other two fill out for you. Uh, and then you can hit clone, and it clones the user, and you can choose whether they're going to get notified immediately or if you just want to build the user. And then you can also choose if you want to bring across, you know, the permission sets, the queues, the public groups, all the stuff that is just very painful. So it takes, it takes creating the user down from, could be 10, 15, 30 minutes down to literally seconds. So that is another one. I'm sure everybody's heard of that one too. All right, at this point, someone's had to have a question. Yeah, who's going to be brave? Who's be brave. Be very, very brave. I have a question. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, go for it. Oh, hey, um, just that again. Uh, the question was, uh, what are the implications if we wanted to um, create an opportunity from some other object instead of from lead? So what happens to my, is there any effect in reporting or uh, from Salesforce standpoint, is there any other implication in our system? Like what, what exactly happens system-wise if we say, you know, if we want a, um, a custom object that we want to use to um, – store some custom information, and then we want to convert it into an opportunity. Is it even possible? Or if it's possible, you know, how, how does that affect uh, the process? Or uh, how does that affect how Salesforce functions? Sure. So that's a good question. That's an intriguing one. So the question is, as I take it, like, hey, I don't want to use leads because, A, maybe they have restrictions, they don't do something I don't like, or I want to use something custom. Maybe it's a security thing or a licensing thing. So I want to use a custom object, or, and I want to be able to go from that custom object into an opportunity. I want to be able to build an opportunity. And I have a use case for this. Sometimes you'll see it in financial services uh, where there's a thing called a referral. So if I'm an existing client, so I'm not going to be a lead, right? So I'm existing. I'm, I exist in the planet. I have a contact record. But I'm referring business, or, or I'm referring business inter, right, from from new business, but I'm already existing. So you're not going to go create a lead for me. That makes no sense. Um, so you create a referral, which would be a custom object. But from that referral, I want to then create an opportunity. So absolutely, you can. Uh, I mean, uh, you can easily build a, a process to do that, to you know, click a button, change a field, whatever, and then the opportunity will be built, automate, you know, automated. And we used to do that in Earl Hacks, but that's a bad thing. You don't do that anymore. Um, and then we create the opportunity. Um, the downside to that, I think, really, you, you already kind of hit it, which was the analytics. So there, you know, in the sales world, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of measurements around what people are using 
um, you know, why salespeople are doing whatever, what they're doing, how successful, how they're not successful, you know, what they're selling, what they're not selling. Um, the, uh, and one of them is lead conversion. So there's lots of reports and analytics in Salesforce that are around lead conversion into opportunities, like things like lead conversion ratios or lead conversion to win ratios or loss ratios. So you can compare, you know, salespeople and, hey, they were given these 3,000 leads and they converted this percentage of them, and out of that percentage of converted into opportunities, here's what they got, here's what was closed one, here was close loss. So that's one thing to think about. That would not work, right? Because you're not converting the lead, so you kind of lose that, um, lose that piece as well. Uh, the second piece probably that you're going to, uh, that just pops in my head is the campaigns. So campaigns um, naturally, you know, work with campaign members over to leads. And as, you know, leads can come in, they get sent to campaigns for marketing purposes and for measurement of ROI. And as those things get converted, right, that campaign and the campaign hierarchy and the campaign influence, again, these are all reporting sort of analytics things, uh, get moved over to the opportunity. So if you wanted to run reports on, hey, we held this webinar, uh, we, we had an MVP, you know, uh, ask an MVP on Friday and this many people came and we converted that many into leads and those or those opportunities and here's what we won off of it or we went to Dreamforce as a campaign or I held a... I had a client who had a hunting event. They, they took all their clients hunting, right? And they wanted to track, oh, I invited this many leads, and how many turned into real business? And how much was that business worth, right? Because the opportunity is going to track how, how big it is and, you know, uh, in the amount field. So that kind of stuff is what you would lose by not using the sort of lead conversion process. Um, but that, I think, you know, off the top of my head, I think those are really the only big things you're going to lose. It's not gonna, I don't think it's going to affect anything else in Salesforce. It's really, so it's not going to break anything. It's just not going to, you're just going to lose some level of analytics and reporting that might be useful or might not. Thanks. You're welcome. Awesome. Good stuff. All right, we got about 12 minutes left. Who else <laughs> has questions? Someone's got to have a question. I'm trying to find my one last resource. I might have to ask. I might have to ask a friend, call a friend. Um, I'm going to say it aloud. See if, that, see if that friend hears me. What's the um, What's the resource that one website with all the tools, all the admin tools? You know what I'm talking about? All right. I, I call the friend inside. I forgot where it is. But there's a website with uh, a great, it like, kind of has like six or seven different of the admin tools, the sort of, you know, built ones out. Um, and of course, I forgot where it is. Uh, shows that I didn't keep it, but it has nice links to lots of places. All right, so while that's being found, and before I talk about it, what, uh, what are the questions? That'll be your reward for asking another question. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I want to call out somebody. Justin, uh, I see you're on there. Do you have uh, any any questions we can help you out with? Um, well, now that you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> now, you know, you guys were talking about the and activating, you know, your lead process. And, you know, I don't want to go and make you guys go into the details, but just in general, how does that process work in order to track, um, you know, which opportunities were attributed to a lead, just high level? You know, how does, how does an opportunity get tied to a lead and campaign? Um, how are you guys using that, I guess? It is. It's actually automated. That's one of the built-in. That's one of the built-in features of leads and opportunities. Is that during that conversion process, it yeah. it's, it just works. And that's why there's some things in Salesforce that are you know, are built in of the of the objects. You know, we call objects like you know the gold objects and the silver objects, and then the abandoned objects like solutions is the poor old abandoned object or something like contracts. Although they've gotten help, they've gotten some love recently, but. You know, leads and opportunities and accounts and contacts are, are the gold standard of, of 
Salesforce objects. So they have tons and tons of built-in functionality. Most people don't even don't even know that they do that. And yeah. you know, opportunities, there's tons of stuff. But that that process of where something gets when when you click on a lead and it connects it, right? The lead kind of gets deleted, although it doesn't really get deleted. But and it converts over all that reporting you can do on it and doing lead conversion stuff is all built right in. So there's nothing you have to do. It's just it has to go through that lead conversion. Um, and it has to be, you know, from that convert the, the convert button. Does that does that help? Uh, yeah. It, it, um, so we actually have, um, you know, uh, a process here where once somebody's already in contact, you know, they can be added to campaigns, marketing campaigns in the future, and everything. And they're trying to so um, they're trying to be able to tie those opportunities that come out of, you know, like a campaign or whatever back to, you know, the, the specific marketing campaign. And so it, it's easier when it's a lead, you know, because they it comes in for marketing, uh, the salesperson converts it to an opportunity, and then, you know, that's really nice reporting and everything. But it gets a little more complicated, I guess, for us when um, it's already an existing contact and we're selling them something else based on a marketing campaign and everything. But, right. But those, so if, if the contact is related to a campaign, and there is a little bit of, and I'm sure there's a doc somewhere, and I don't know where it is, but there's sort of the doc that tells you all the little bits and logic of why, but there's pieces to a campaign about whether it's active or not, whether it's start date or end date. And so when you're on a contact and you create, you create a new opportunity from that contact, it will associate it to a campaign. It will automatically do that for you. Um, but it has to be a campaign and, you know, again, the idea is that a contact can be part of many campaigns. Some are old and dead, and some are new and ongoing. Um, and in op in opportunities, you always have the main campaign that it gets associated. The opportunity gets, and then you get the campaign uh, influence. So it'll pull over all of the campaigns that are related, and sort of they're all part of the influence of that opportunity. Cool. All right. One 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 last question. Does everybody want to know the link that uh, I found? I didn't find I my uh, my my assistant my lovely <laughs> found <laughs> as he as he scoffs at you in the background yeah yeah he's, uh, as he's scoffing at me in the background uh, hint yeah, hint we're about to go uh, podcast together so um, all right so to prove that we actually do work together so this is the sale, so thank you Justin you're welcome there Hello. you go Just yeah no problem. yep. What a this big does help. not count. This does not count for him being on there, though. It counts. I'm on. It does not count. It does not count. <laughs> you, were, yeah, you were sitting. You were sitting behind me doing uh, nothing. I was listening the whole time. So true. Uh, so Salesforce Toolkit. I just put it. The sftoolkit.co um, has a lot of great tools on it. Um, the two that I would point you to immediately as very good. The ones that I've used. Um, I definitely use Org Doctor. That's a very good one. But I think the one that is very powerful is Switch. So quickly, easily, and disable org validation rules, workflows, and Apex triggers. Um, this is very, very, very powerful. Obviously, you only want to do this when, when you actually need to. But the use case is in, in deployments or in special orgs, like you want to be able to turn off stuff. Um, you know, especially validation rules, which are great, but you know, sometimes they haven't been written very well or no one thought about data loading or no one thought about, you know, system admins doing things. And so you could have 20, 30 validation rules that check in a bunch of things. Um, uh, so you could easily turn them off. Justin is telling me over Slack to talk about test classes. Yes, that's another use case. Um, so that's a great, great app. But anyway, this, is, this should be bookmarked. I actually am booking mark, booking marking it. Um, right now because it's that good um, and just a great set of tools out there for, for admins. So definitely put that into your, along with the commissioner, we should get, why are we not on this page? We need, we need to be on this page. The same person may have done all of them. Oh, well, no, that's why we did all of them. But anyway, some great, some great tools um, and uh, I would suggest putting these, if you're an admin, these are great things to have and to know about save you tons and tons and tons of time. Yeah, this is great. I think I've seen I think I'd seen this before but I never explored it. So, yeah. Yeah. So, 
a lot of great stuff. Yeah. It's sort of, that's sort of the trick of the trick of being a Salesforce admin is just knowing all the knowing all the tricks and knowing all the things yeah. that can take you to, you know, usually would take you ten hours to do and oh there's an app that does that in like four seconds. Thanks. Thanks for playing. <laughs> Yeah, I, awesome. I would say the other day, I um, since no one's asking questions, I'll just keep moving on. I had a use case where someone was asking, uh, they wanted to upgrade Conga. So Conga, you know, is, is button based, so it isn't going to work in Lightning for yet. But Conga is all these buttons, and you have these buttons everywhere in your org, buttons, buttons, buttons. And if you use Conga a lot, you have tons of buttons. And to upgrade from Conga seven to eight, you have to actually change the button. Um, and you obviously can float around your org and look at every page and or look at every object and look at the buttons and figure out which ones are which. Um, but using using a using the API and, and an IDE, just I just pulled down all the data, so pulled down the whole like schema and all the all the objects, and then just searched. And it was unbelievable. It's just like something that probably could have taken hours and you missed stuff. Searched through all the metadata of Salesforce and found the conga buttons. You can even change them if you want right there easily. Um, but it's that kind of stuff that you just learn over time that makes life so much easier. Genius. It's genius. Awesome. Cool. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, Jason, we really appreciate your time and expertise and even the little uh, phone a friend from Justin there uh, <laughs> to help us out there at the end. Um, but, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, – and what you what you guys do for the Salesforce community. So, um, okay. uh, last uh, last thing I'll say is we're, our next special guest uh, is uh, Kartik here. Um, he's uh, out of Boston um, and an MVP and knows a a lot about uh, Apex, etc. So, uh, be looking for the sign up on that. Um, that'll be a, a great uh, session if you're just looking to learn stuff about development uh, on the platform. Um, Kartik is uh, is great at that. So, uh, with that being said, just want to say thank you to joining uh, the office hours, and um, everyone have a great weekend. And we will talk to you on the next session. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you.